Stephen Kubacki. It's the winter of 1978 in the American Midwest, and Stephen Kubacki, a student from Hope College, is taking advantage of the last days of February before spring began to go skiing. He leaves his student digs to go on a solo cross-country skiing trip. Kubacki was an accomplished outdoorsman who climbed mountains in Europe and was an avid cross-country skier. Familiar with the area, this was an ordinary weekend pursuit for Kubacki and to those at college who knew him. However, this small excursion would end up being far from ordinary. Several days later, the alarm was raised when Kubacki failed to return from what should have been a day's activity. At the same time, snowmobilers on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan had come across a set of abandoned skis and ski poles. The police knew immediately who they belonged to. A search party was sent out, utilizing both land and air rescue, with helicopters and locals deployed to find Stephen. Only two more things were subsequently discovered, Stephen's backpack and his footprints in the deep, frozen snow. There was something off about the scene, however. The backpack looked as if it had been abruptly thrown to the ground, and the heavy footprints disappeared into nothingness as if Kubaki had walked out of reality. Looking to close off the case with a sense of logic, police figured a more rational explanation. Close to the shores of frozen Lake Michigan, Stephen must have removed his skis and wandered too close to the water, falling through the ice and drowning into the watery depths below. His friends grieved, his family mourned, and life returned to normal as the months passed by. That is, until 15 months later, Stephen Kubiaki walked straight through the door of his family house over 500 miles away. Stephen told his recollection of events as best he could. That day, May 5th, 1979, he woke up on a grassy knoll in Massachusetts, some 700 miles due east from where he disappeared. He was wearing clothes that were not his, had items such as maps and signs that were neither his nor written by him, and he had no concept of the amount of time that had passed. It was only when he was able to purchase a newspaper he would realize that he had re-emerged to consciousness 15 months later than when he first set off. The last thing he remembered before this was striding forwards on his skis as he made his way around Lake Michigan. Before he knew it, however, he experienced a momentary blip, being enveloped in a cold and frozen darkness that hurried him from one point to another which felt like he was running. Aside from this, he had no other details to give, and yet the mystery of what happened that day in February 1978 was perhaps less about Kubaki and more about where he was. Urban myths run rife that Lake Michigan is home to cross-dimensional disappearances, essentially the Bermuda Triangle of the Great Lakes. It's not just Kubaki who went missing in this area. Ships, planes and other people have all disappeared and for whom there was never any trace of again. As of today, Kubaki's disappearance and reappearance remains a mystery. Two hundred ninety million year old footprint in New Mexico. How long have humans been on this planet for? The most commonly accepted answer from the scientific community says around two hundred thousand years, at least in our modern anatomic form, with perhaps our bipedal ancestors harking further back in time to six million years ago. However, a new discovery in New Mexico has come to turn all these theories upside down. In the footprints of a mountain range in New Mexico, a series of impressions left in the ancient rocks cast new insights into our origins and what life might have looked like hundreds of millions of years ago. Jerry Paul MacDonald, an eccentric paleontologist, was on an expedition in the region, an area well known for the fossilized imprints that might be found there. These imprints are known as trace fossils, physical evidence of tracks, trails and resting marks left behind of now vanished organisms. Usually, Jerry MacDonald might expect to see the imprint of a trail left by a dinosaur or perhaps the burrow of an ancient reptile. What he stumbled upon, however, was far more puzzling than anything he had ever seen before. He came across a certain rock formation, which had several fossilized imprints of creatures from much later periods than the actual age of that rock strata. There were tracks made from modern species of birds and fossilized paw marks of bears that should be much closer to our time period than of the rock they were imprinted on. It's important to note that the period the rock was from was from the Permian period, an era where there weren't supposed to be birds, and was certainly a long time before bears. 
the evolutionary process for these species just was not underway then. That was all bewildering enough to MacDonald, but then he saw something that did not make any sense at all to him. At least not against prevailing scientific thought. Human footprints. These footprints had the clear characteristics of a human foot, with indications of a mud up push, essentially a rim of raised relief around the fossilized imprint, which added to its authenticity. What was perplexing, however, was that this footprint was found in the same rock strata from the Permian period, 290 to 248 million years ago. That was the time period long before birds or even dinosaurs existed on this planet, let alone man. Could this be evidence of man's earliest civilization, far beyond anything scientists have ever led us to believe? The Permian period ended with the largest mass extinction in history, with billions of species wiped from the planet, and a devastated ecosystem that took 30 million years to recover. As such, it's not too far a stretch to say that at that time the Earth might have hit the reset button with this imprint being one of the only things left of an ancient human species that took their place on Earth well before us. The Horned Beast of Bahia, Brazil During the hot summer months in the state of Bahia, located in the country of Brazil, it is not uncommon for a large influx of American tourists to make use of the coastal towns as a summer getaway vacation area. It was during these pristine tourism months that a mysterious image emerged from the area of Bahia, Brazil, of what could only be described as a demonic-looking humanoid horned beast that can be seen in crystal clarity to be bathing in a muddy river surrounded by dense mangrove trees while carrying what appears to be a body of a young child dangling in its arms. Although there is little reliable information surrounding the image circulating across the internet, Countless sources cite that the image was taken by a young female American tourist, believed to be only 15 years old, of whom saw the strange creature and took a quick photo before fleeing the region. Given the incredible clarity of the image, many believed that if the photo is faked, it would have to have been via the use of practical effects or a misidentification on the part of the young girl who took the picture. Some have tried to explain away the photograph, claiming that the creature seen in the image is nothing more than a clam fisherman. As the area is commonly known for clam fishing, with many clam fishermen using secluded areas as their own personal hotspots. However, the image shows a man completely covered in mud from head to toe, with his mouth, eyes and skin completely grey in colour, with no inch of pinkish flesh or human features. The horns on the creature have been dismissed as nothing more than the possible mud-crusted hair that was pointing in different directions. However, the image clearly shows the creature to have a bald, dome-like head with sharp protrusions from the side with no other clumping of hair visible. Every skeptic explanation also fails to address what appears to be the body of a limp child dangling from the creature's arms. Continued sightings have been made over the years surrounding the Bahia horned beast, leaving many to wonder if the dense forestry and unclaimed natural land hides a dark and sinister demonic entity taking advantage of the countless number of people who go missing every year. No further evidence has been gathered surrounding the creature. The Anomaly Under the Sea Referred to as the Mound in the Sea, there appears to be a strange underwater anomaly directly underneath the Sea of Galilee. This strange mound was discovered back in 2003, when research scientists were doing searches under the water in the hopes of uncovering ancient artifacts from the region. After further analysis, researchers believe the area to be artificial in nature and having formed by the hand of ancient people from long ago. The mound is located under 30 feet of water, and so it's believed that perhaps the area was once above water and used as a construction site. The mound itself is believed to have been built using a variety of basalt rocks that have been sacked into a cone shape, while being twice the size of Stonehenge. In more recent reports concerning the finding, archaeologists have written that the mound shares similar characteristics with that of ancient communal burial sites, and so it might have been used for such a purpose. Others believe that it could have been a large ramp or a ceremonial structure of some kind, but has been slowly grinded down from the subtle movements of the water that surround it. 
Today, no further research into the area has continued, and not a single research scientist has been able to accurately date the structure or uncover its true purpose during that of the ancient world. The Blackbeard Merfolk Sighting Edward Blackbeard Teach is remembered as one of the most fearsome men to have ever lived, becoming a legend during his own lifetime as one of the greatest pirates to have ever lived. Although his reign as a pirate only lasted a short two years, it was the terrifying cruelty of Blackbeard that cemented him as a legend. Many merchants and fishermen would often claim that when in battle against Blackbeard, they had believed him to be the devil himself due to the fact that he would often put smoking fuses in his long black hair and beard and strapped weapons on his body to make himself look less human and more like a monster. It is for this reason that experts find it extremely peculiar that Blackbeard often wrote that his number one fear of the open sea was that of his mermaid sightings made in specific regions. Blackbeard often wrote that he believed the sighting of the creatures were an omen of bad luck and that they had made attempts to drag him under the water and steal his gold. Blackbeard would often end his logbook reports with warnings to his crew members of the enchanting powers of the mermaids and never to revisit the areas of his sightings. The Tunguska Event Russia is known for being a powerhouse and being home to some of the greatest nuclear power on the planet, but this power has caused various issues for the country. One interesting case happened back in 1908. On the morning of the 30th of June 1908, a large explosion occurred near the Tunguska River. This terrifying explosion over the hardly populated region of eastern Siberia erased around 80 million trees. Whatever this explosion was ripped through the area with ease and caused a massive amount of damage. The large majority of the trees have been wiped of its branches. It's also said that around three people died in the event. When it comes to the reason behind this famous incident, various theories have been put forward, the majority of which people can't seem to agree on. One of the most accepted theories is that a meteorite caused the destruction of the area. Interestingly, scientists and researchers have classified this as an impact event, even though no impact crater or objects have ever been discovered, something that's led people to look at alternative theories to explain the mysterious event. Scientists, however, have stuck to the meteorite story and say that the object that caused the damage would have been large. They suggested that the object disintegrated at around 5 to 12 miles in the sky. Back in 1908 when this incident happened, science was not at the level it is now. Due to this, researchers at the time had limited instruments. The magnitude of the event has helped modern researchers to come to a more conclusive answer for what happened here. As it took around 10 to 11 years to find out information on this incident, and because many people living in the area were religious, they concluded that the reason this event happened was because their god was not happy with them. Science has said that various studies have allowed them to come up with different estimates of the size of the meteorite, ranging from 50 to 190 meters, depending on how fast the body was traveling. Along with the size of the meteorite, other factors were also measured in order to reach a decision. Tests showed that the energy of this object would have been the same as 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. More than a hundred years after the event, only a few clues remain. For such a large event, it's left behind no clue whatsoever. Interestingly, researchers have said that much larger events happened in Earth's history, but this event is considered one of the largest impact events ever recorded in the history of the Earth. Today, after more than 100 years of the event, scientists still believe there is something we are missing. One NASA scientist said the following about the event. A century later, some still debate the cause and come up with different scenarios that could have caused the explosion. But the generally agreed-upon theory is that on the morning of June the 30th, 1908, a large space rock, about 120 feet across, entered the atmosphere of Siberia and then detonated in the sky. Paveglia In the Italian waters of the Venetian lagoon, between the cities of Venice and Lido, there is an island that has become almost synonymous with death. That island is Paveglia. 
once home to a plague quarantine station, later retrofitted into a mental institution. It's no wonder people claim thousands of lost souls inhabit this island. But Perveglia didn't set out to become the island of nightmares. In fact, from 1793 to 1814, it was simply a Larazetto, or plague quarantine station. Perveglia's location made it a prime place for screening ships before docking in Venice. It wasn't even the only one. There were many of these types of stations throughout the lagoon. In a time when plagues were common, Venice had found isolation helped to soften the blow of many outbreaks. Before a trade ship was allowed to dock, travelers were to spend 40 days on Perveglia. In fact, the term quarantine comes from the French word for 40 days. In these days, the stays were pleasant. Travelers had their own apartments, were fed well, and could even drink and spend time together. However, when the plague outbreaks worsened, so did the conditions on Perveglia. Fear of the disease caused infected people to be shipped on an undeniably one-way trip to the island. It was so bad that it is believed people who didn't even have the plague were shipped off as well, left to die with the infected. Some numbers count the dead at over 160,000. Legend has it that over 50% of the topsoil is composed of human ash from the mass burning of the dead. Years later, in 1922, a mental hospital was opened on the island. The patients were quick to complain of ghosts and voices echoing throughout the halls. These claims, of course, were brushed aside at first, marked as the ranting of insane minds. It is said that due to its remote location, the mental hospital drew ill-reputed scientists and doctors who treated their patients as they pleased. This often culminated in abuse and experiments. Legends tell of one specifically heinous doctor who began performing experiments on his patients. This doctor was a great believer in lobotomies and performed many, often with crude tools and no anesthetic. The doctor was rumored to hold even worse experiments in the bell tower of the hospital. Patients were often kept awake from the screams that echoed from there. As it is told, after being driven mad, either by his own actions or by the many ghosts already said to have been wandering the grounds, the doctor later threw himself off the bell tower of the hospital. According to a nurse who saw him fall, she claims he did not die from the fall, but to a ghostly mist who overtook the body once he landed. It seems the Italian people grow wary of people trying to get on the now forbidden island. Many residents express that they have no intention of going to the island. Some go as far to denounce its mental hospital days, calling it a rest home for the elderly. This, however, has been disproved with the types of equipment found inside. It remains illegal to go to the island. However, some people have been able to convince boaters to take them there. People who have visited the island have reported anything from the feeling of being watched to being scratched and pushed some hearing the screams of the mad doctor's victims. Even more eerie, the bell in the bell tower is still said to chime, even though it has been removed. Kidnapped by Bigfoot The year was 1924. The gold rush may have been over, but that did not stop Swedish immigrant Albert Ostman from giving gold prospecting a go. After spending years in construction and logging, Ostman decided it was time for something different, and he thought he might as well get a little vacation out of it while he was at it. He had heard of a rumour of a gold mine near Toba Inlet, near Vancouver, Canada. The area was lush with trees and surrounded by mountains, the perfect getaway from his recent year-long construction job. He hired a local indigenous man as a guide to the head of the Toba Inlet. The guide was a talkative man and told Ostman tales of the area. One tale even involved the rumoured gold mine. According to him, there was a heavy drinking white man who would come and go from the mine, always having gold to spare. But one time, he never came back from the mine. They suspected a Sasquatch had killed him. He described the creatures as having hair all over their bodies, but they stood upright like people. And they were big, approximately eight feet tall, big enough to leave two foot long tracks. Ostman had never heard of such a creature and brushed the tale aside as folklore. Once the guide had dropped him at a site at the head of the inlet, Ostman asked him to come back for him in three weeks. He would camp back at that particular spot once he was finished with his prospecting trip. Over the next week, he worked his way over ten miles into the wilderness on the hunt for the elusive gold mine. After some time, he came to a spot that he deemed perfect for his permanent setup. 
He was only there a single night when strange things started to occur. Ostman awoke after a deep and heavy sleep to discover that his entire campsite had been disturbed. He hadn't heard anything the night before and simply blamed it on an animal. On night two, his backpack had been dumped out. He noted that food had been taken. Instead of going out to look for gold, Ostman hung around the camp, hoping to catch a glimpse at the culprit. But nothing showed itself. On the third night, he was determined to stay awake. He needed to know what was lurking in the darkness around his site. That, however, proved to be impossible. Having obviously fallen asleep, he was awoken by something picking him up off the ground, still cocooned in his sleeping bag. After being dragged and carried for what he believes was three hours, Ostman was finally dropped. He described hearing four voices, speaking in a language he didn't understand, but it was too dark to make them out. As the sun came up, however, he got a good look. There were indeed four of them. He described them as an old man and an old woman, along with a young boy and girl. He estimated the old woman to have been over seven feet tall and 500 pounds. The old man was even bigger than that. He was sure his gun would not affect the large man, except for maybe angering him, so he sat and contemplated his escape. The family of Sasquatches kept him in a small valley for days, occasionally bringing him sweet roots as food. The young ones, who started out shy, eventually took an interest in him. He made them water ladles and tossed them old snuff cans to play with, and that's when he came up with his ingenious escape plan. He had once heard a story of a man blinding a bull by throwing snuff into its eyes. Next, he threw the young boy Sasquatch another snuff box, this time with a teaspoon of snuff inside. The young boy tasted the snuff and then took it to the old man. It was obvious they enjoyed the taste of it and came back for more. Ostman then knew he had to get the old man to eat a whole box of snuff and then hopefully he could get away. Because of the interest in the snuff, the old man kept getting closer to Ostman, eventually grabbing a box and emptying it into his mouth. He swallowed it in one gulp before licking the box clean. After a few minutes, the old man became sick. Ostman saw his opening and ran. Using his rifle, he shot warning shots as he escaped. He miraculously was not followed. He made his way down the mountain and finally into a nearby camp. He merely told the locals he was lost and did not mention the sight of their Sasquatch until much later, fearing being called crazy. Needless to say, he never tried prospecting again. The Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley When the Bradley family from America boarded the Rhapsody of the Sea for a week-long cruise, Little did they know this would be their last holiday together as a whole family. Ron and Ivor Bradley, their son Brad, 21, and daughter Amy, 23, embarked on the cruise ship in Aruba on the 21st of March, 1998. Three days later, Amy would disappear from their lives forever. After a night of partying on March the 23rd, Amy Bradley finished the evening drinking with the ship's band, Blue Orchid, in the dance club. One of the band members, Alistair Douglas, a.k.a. Yellow, would subsequently say that Amy left to return to her room at about 1am. Around 5.30am, Bradley's father, his room adjacent to Amy's, wakes briefly before falling back to sleep, but remembers seeing Amy on her cabin balcony sleeping at that time. When Ron got up at 6am, he noticed Amy was no longer there. When he went to check up on her, he discovered that she wasn't in her room at all. During that time the ship would soon be docking at Curacao, and the Bradley family notified the ship's security that their daughter was missing. A quick search of the ship found nothing, and fearful that Amy had been kidnapped, the Bradleys pleaded with the crew not to let any passengers off at Curacao. Not wanting to disappoint its passengers, the ship refused, and at Curacao, thousands streamed off the cruise liner, and perhaps so too did any chance of finding Amy. Further searches of the ship and the sea produced no signs of her whereabouts, and on March the 29th, the official search was ended. Investigators saw no evidence she had fallen overboard, or anything that could point to suicide, and yet there were no clear answers of where the 23-year-old could be. Various sightings occurred in the years following her disappearance. In 1999, a naval officer stated that at a brothel in Curacao, a woman, upon hearing another American, came up to him saying, my name is Amy Bradley and I need help. 
before two burly men noticed this and escorted her out of the room and he could make anything more of it. Another sighting occurred in 2005, when a witness named Julie Mora apparently saw Amy in a department store restroom. She claimed the woman entered the bathroom with three large men, who proceeded to threaten her if she did not follow through on a deal. Mora alleged that after the men had left, she approached the distraught woman, who then said that her name was Amy and that she was from Virginia before the men re-entered to take her away. By the time Mora was able to call the authorities, the group was gone. Towards the end of 2005, Amy's parents also revealed they had received photos of a scantily clad woman with a strong resemblance to their missing daughter. Whilst showing perhaps that Amy was still alive, possibly having been abducted and sold into sexual slavery, it still remains that her location is unknown. The Bradleys have never given up their search, however, and still today offer a $250,000 reward for information leading to Amy's whereabouts. Mystery Airships, 1896-1897 Almost a decade before the Wright brothers' first flight, numerous sightings of strange, cigar-shaped UFOs were spotted across the United States. Starting in 1896 and continuing to 1897, these mystery airships were bigger and faster than anything else known at that time. The first sighting was reported in the winter of 1896. A light was seen slowly moving through the Sacramento night sky on November 17th, with otherworldly sounds being heard as it passed overhead. The mystery light reappeared on the evening of November 21st, and then subsequently seen over more than half a dozen cities including San Francisco and Oakland, and viewed by hundreds of witnesses. Not long after, more unidentified airships would be seen. On the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, one was seen having crash-landed to the ground, it was 20 feet in length, 8 feet in diameter and propelled by three giant propellers. An on-the-spot witness approached the ship and came across its two pilots. They looked human, however their language was nothing of this world. They attempted with difficulty to communicate, trying to ascertain the pilot's origins. Eventually they both pointed upwards and apparently uttered something that sounded like the word Mars, before quickly returning to their airship and launching high into the sky leaving witnesses completely mystified below. These unidentified objects would also be the first reported stories of alien abduction. The first occurred in April 1897, and involved another mystery airship hovering over a farmer's cattle pen. Upon closer examination, onlookers realised that a cable from the airship had roped up a cow, but was struggling to break free, having become entangled in the pen's fence. The group unsuccessfully tried to free the cow, but the fence itself was torn out of the ground, leaving the ship, cow, and part of the fence all rising slowly into the air and sail off into the sky. Interestingly enough, the airships weren't just after livestock, they tried to take people as well. It was on November the 19th, 1896, two days after the first mystery airship sighting over Sacramento. A US Colonel, H.G. Shaw, was driving his buggy through the countryside near Stockton, when he came across what appeared to be a landed airship. Shaw described it as having pointed ends and a silver exterior without any features aside from a rudder for steering. The ship was about 150 feet end-to-end, -end, 25 foot in diameter. Suddenly, to Colonel Shaw's amazement, three slender, seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials exited the craft, all emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy before attending to Shaw himself, deciding to physically force him into their craft. Luckily, the stocky, well-built soldier was physically superior to the thin, lanky beings, and the aliens soon gave up, fleeing back to their ship and quickly speeding out of sight, leaving Colonel Shaw baffled below. The Disappearance of Maurice Gordon Doc Dametz Maurice Gordon Doc Dametz was an 84-year-old Christian reverend of whom had a relatively successful writing career during his time working as a Christian leader of his small community, with a number of successful publications under his belt, such as his works titled Focal Points of Christian History, Trouble Transformed, Bird and Bearing, Mystery of Godliness, and Dead at the Top. 
Unfortunately, Dr. Metz was suffering from a severe blood disorder that made it difficult for him to be alone and had severe arthritis complications that prevented him from being able to move without assistance. Despite these physical limitations, Dr. Metz enjoyed spending his free time venturing out into the wilderness to locate ideal locations for mining precious gems and minerals. De Metz had been a fan of leading his own private expeditions in the field of geology and would often invite a close friend of his to accompany him when making trips out into the national parks or empty stretches of wilderness to assist him during the trip and help him move throughout different pieces of rugged terrain. Doc's fascination for the field of geology would eventually lead him to joining the American Federation of Mineral Societies and Flatiron Gem and Mineral Club, becoming an experienced veteran of private expeditions and mining efforts. It is for all these reasons that it came as a shock to the wife of Dr. Metz when Doc disappeared suddenly and unexpectedly when venturing out into the Pike National Forest located in the front range of Colorado, when taking a trip with his close friend McSherry to find a digging spot for minerals. According to McSherry, the two had found a small sandy pit close to the Rampart Range Road, where McSherry said he had left De Metz to venture out an extra 50 yards to find his own sandy pit to dig from. After about two hours of mining, McSherry returned to Dr. Metz and told him they would be driving home soon because it would be getting dark. Doc had said that he would be gathering his tools while McSherry returned to his pit to pack up his things. After McSherry finished packing his things, he returned to Dr. Metz's pit only to find that he had completely disappeared without a trace. When investigations were made, detectives remarked that the disappearance of Dr. Metz seemed perplexing as there was no evidence of a struggle or any footsteps, markings or tracks left behind in any direction. Additionally, all of Dr. Metz's tools went missing with him, with nothing left in the pit to be used as evidence. On the 18th of July 1981, the wife of Maurice Gordon Dr. Metz wrote a letter to her governor, Governor Richard Lamb, asking for any assistance in helping her find her husband. The letter detailed that she believed some form of conspiracy had been committed against her husband, with thoughts that he had met some form of foul play or had been carried away, but that all efforts for an investigation were being impeded by unseen forces. Despite this letter, no further action was taken, with Dr. Metz declared dead in 1990. The Shag Harbor UFO Incident the Shag Harbor incident took place over half a century ago, but it continues to draw in believers in the unknown and mystery lovers. The incident took place in Shag Harbor, a tiny fishing village on the Atlantic coast on the evening of October 4th in 1967. A group of locals reported seeing a low-flying and brightly lit object soaring through the sky towards Shag Harbor before it crashed and sank into the sea. Laurie Wickens, one of the locals who experienced the strange event, described how he initially assumed the flying object was a crashing plane. He described how he continued to see the object floating one and a half miles from the shore for around an hour and leaving a trail of yellow foam. Ralph Loewinger was actually co-piloting a cargo plane from New York to London on the night and also described seeing a formation of bluish-white lights that was slanted from upper left to lower right that he identified as a big airplane with all of its lights on. With so many credible witness reports, the public intrigue of what had fallen from the sky grew stronger and many people became determined to find an explanation. Norman Smith was one of those people and describes how he and his father and uncle jumped into a fishing boat and sailed to the spot where the object had crashed into the sea. They were soon joined by the Canadian Coast Guard who helped them search for any wreckage but nothing was uncovered. The next day, divers were sent down to explore further, but once again resurfaced with no new information. It was only years later when diver David Svet surveyed the ocean floor of the harbour that underwater anomalies in the area where the object crashed were discovered. Svet described these anomalies as a depression in the ocean floor the size of a perfectly circular dinner plate, with the centre being about a foot deep. This exciting news proved that an object had crashed in this location, but was still not enough to identify what the object was. The most popular theory was that the crashing object must have been a fallen aeroplane, as Wickens and Loewinger had presumed. However, when the nearest Canadian Forces base was contacted, they stated that no missing aircraft had been reported that evening. 
Many theorists claim that the lack of answers of what the flying object was is due to a government cover-up. They argue that it is too coincidental that a secret US military base monitoring subterranean and underwater frequency for Russian submarine activity was just 30 minutes from the site where the object crashed and sank. Either way, there is still no definitive answer to what the object that soared through the sky and crashed in the ocean near Shag Harbor actually was. Boris Weisfehler Military dictatorships, classified information, Russian spies. It all sounds like a movie, but it's not. These are just a few of the crazy details surrounding our first disappearance. Boris Weisfehler was born on April 19, 1941 in Moscow, Russia. He received a PhD from the Steklov Institute of Mathematics, Leningrad. He left the Soviet Union for the United States in 1975, both to better his career and to freely practice his Jewish religion. Here, Weisfehler became a professor at Pennsylvania State University, and in 1981, he became an American citizen. Weisfehler was an avid outdoorsman, so when he told his sister he wanted to spend his winter in Chile, she figured he would enjoy a nice backpacking trip before returning home. In December 1984, he set a course for Chile, but he never returned. Initial reports from Chilean officials state that Weisfehler's backpack was found near a river near the border of Colonia in January of 1985. His disappearance was ruled a drowning. Some fishermen claimed to have given him directions as well as camped with him. Others tell of footprints near the river hinting at the fact he had fallen in and was carried away. Over the years, Conflicting eyewitness reports and the possible involvement of the military-run government cloud up the investigation into his disappearance. And since so many years have passed, it has become impossible to sort fact from fiction. Under the military rule of Chile, General Augusto Pinochet was well known for his crimes against human rights, including a colony called Colonia Dignidad. In this colony, political criminals of Pinochet's were held and tortured. Over 1,100 people disappeared under Pinochet's rule. Unsurprisingly, Colonia Dignidad was not far from where Weisfehler went missing. In June of 2000, the US State Department declassified over 250 documents containing information on Weisfehler's disappearance. The documents included various eyewitness accounts spanning six years after he went missing. One document even stated that there were persistent reports that Boris Weisfehler was or is detained in Colonia Dignidad. It was suggested that he was captured as a Russian spy. A document from the US Embassy from 1987 listed two sources of information on Weisfehler. One of these again confirmed his detainment in Colonia Dignidad and suggested he was still a prisoner there at that time. The other claimed a passing patrol killed him on the spot. In 2006, a letter signed by 27 senators and representatives was sent to Michelle Bachelet, President of Chile, with the hopes she could relaunch an investigation. In August of 2012, eight retired military officers who were suspected of the disappearance of Weisfehler were arrested. According to the courts, these officers were prosecuted for kidnapping and complicity in Weisfehler's disappearance. However, in 2016, the case was closed. A judge ruled Weisfehler's disappearance a crime for which the statute of limitations had passed and that no human rights were violated. So, what do you believe? Did Weisfehler slip into a fast-moving river to be swept away and never seen again, or the more sinister option? Did he spend his final days in a torture camp being accused of espionage? The Mysterious Sky Disk the Nebra Sky Disk was originally discovered by two men back in 1999 that were treasure hunting with a metal detector without a license in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. This led to the treasure hunters unearthing the disk, two bronze swords, two hatchets, a small chisel and a number of fragments of spiral bracelets throughout the region. Well aware of their finds without that of a treasure hunting license, the two men quickly decided to sell the artifacts to the black market in order to cover up their looting and make money in the process. This decision led to them selling the entire find for 31,000 Deutschmarks to a private collector in Cologne. 
The find would then go on to exchange hands within the black market community for several years, leading to the value of the piece being sold at more than a million Deutschmarks throughout Germany. It was not until 2001 that the discovery would find itself within the public eye, leading to a police operation to recover the looted collection and trace the sale all the way back to the original finders back in February of 2002. This led to the two men working out a plea deal with the government by showing them the original excavation site, which led to them only receiving roughly four to ten months in prison. Unfortunately, the two men would later try to appeal, leading to them receiving six to twelve months of prison time. The Nebra Sky Disc is described as being a small disc a mere twelve inches in diameter and weighing close to five pounds in total. The dating of the disc was found to be from the middle of the second millennium BC, making the artifact roughly 4,000 years old. The disc itself seems to be a strange find as it features images of a full moon, a waxing moon, the Pleiades constellation, and additional zones on the sides to mark the rising and setting of the sun with the depiction of a boat moving across the night sky. This has led to some researchers believing that the disc could be evidence of an astronomical instrument whereas others argue that it may have some religious significance. Additionally, ancient alien theorists have speculated that it could be evidence of an ancient UFO sighting of a shape moving across the night sky that was recorded in ancient times. Derek J. Luking Don't try to follow me. Those are the final words of 24-year-old Derek J. Luking. Found scribbled on a note in Liu King's abandoned car, it is the final piece of evidence in his strange disappearance. Liu King grew up in Virginia before moving to Knoxville, Tennessee, to attend college at Johnson University. After graduating, he took a job as an orderly at Peninsula Behavioral Health Center. Described by his roommate as having a servant heart, it raised a red flag when Liu King failed to show up for work on the morning of March 15, 2012. This uncharacteristic behavior caused Liu King's family to leave Virginia for Tennessee to look for him immediately. A quick search of his computer found searches for the nearby Smoky Mountain National Park as well as reservations for a hotel. The hotel, located in Cherokee, North Carolina, had footage of Liu King leaving his room on March 17th, two days after he failed to show up for work. Inside the hotel room, Liu King left a Bible and a bottle of alcohol. Determined to find him, Liu King's family set out to search the area for themselves. By accident, the family came upon Liu King's abandoned Ford Escape. The vehicle was in the newfound Gap parking area, located along the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. Contents of the vehicle seemed to suggest Liu King had plans of a long hike or even camping. With him, he had a pickaxe, compass, lamp, pocket knife, knife sharpener, tent, sleeping bag, 100 feet of black parachute cord, granola bars, and a survival belt containing a multi-tool, flashlight, and a fire starter. There were also pages from a military survival guide, along with his wallet still full of cash. The last clue was the note. Don't follow me. Some assume this was a sure sign that Liu King was planning on leaving and never returning. Liu King's father noted that his behavior had changed recently. Liu King began smoking and drinking. He complained about where he was in life and about being unsatisfied with his job. His family was firm, however, that Liu King was not depressed and would not kill himself. Ignoring the note's request, search and rescue teams began to search the woods in the newfound Gap area. Interviews with hikers in the area turned up nothing. Even though it was a beautiful day and the park was busy, no one remembered seeing Liu King. This led investigators to believe that Liu King had either avoided the crowds intentionally or left the trail almost as soon as he stepped foot on it. Trails in the area are well marked, but it is incredibly easy to get lost if someone ventures off of them. Search teams scoured the woods, looking for any sign of Liu King. There were no obvious signs of his presence. Many searches led to rhododendron thickets that he could not have passed through without obvious evidence of him being there. Some believe Liu King went missing while scouting the trail, fully intending to come back for his gear. Others think he planned to take his own life, but the purchase of nearly $1,000 in camping gear would prove frivolous if this was his intention all along. 
So what happened to Derek Liu King? Why did he have an arsenal of outdoor gear but didn't bring it with him onto the trails? Did he write the simple four-word note indicating he had no intention of returning? The search for Derek Liu King is not over. Despite years of searching, no sign of him has ever shown up. The Lower Yellowstone Falls This 308-foot-long waterfall is known to be one of the most haunting places on the planet, yet many people aren't aware that it holds this title. The story which gives it this title started in 1870. Back in 1870, there were four men who were accompanied with their guide. At the time, they were trying to make their way across the Yellowstone Canyon. Their guide warned them firsthand about the isolated Sheep Eater tribe that they may face once they move deeper into the canyon. He also informed them about their mischievous activities and their habits of theft. The legend goes that the Sheep Eater tribe stole the horses from the men. They then tried to get away on the stolen horses, but the group of men managed to track down the tribe. They caught these tribe people at a very dangerous place, crossing above the lower falls on the Yellowstone River. The tribe then jumped into the river and started to swim to the other side. However, while watching this, the explorers noticed the strong river current, and this made them soon realize that the tribesmen would never succeed in crossing the river. It started to become difficult for the tribe, but the horses were helping them, because the men wanted their horses back. They started to make their way towards the tribe members. However, while they were doing this, they heard a loud sound. Their guide shot one of the members of the tribe. This angered the explorers as they told the guide they didn't want to hurt them. They just wanted to get their horses back. The tribe managed to get on a raft, but the guide shot at them again, causing the raft to sink. After this, out of nowhere, arrows started to come from all directions, one of which was able to hit the guide. It's not known who fired these arrows, but some have said an ancient elder protects the natives from any outsiders. Interestingly, while standing close to the falls, some people have reported hearing Native American chants and even seeing the apparitions of Native Americans. The 1890 Newark Bay Sighting Back in 1472, after ceaseless battles spanning over several hundred years against the Norse civilization, the Scottish people went on to claim the lasting ownership of the region of Orkney, a group of 70 stunningly beautiful islands that hold a rich history of human habitation for more than 8,000 years. Since the dawn of this strained ownership, however, Scotland has seen its own fair share of odd detailed reports describing strange aquatic humanoid creatures nearing the shores of the Orkney Islands. Although there are too many stories to tell surrounding the mermaids of Orkney over several centuries, the most well-known sighting of the Orkney mermaids is that of the 1890 Newark Bay sighting that took place off the shore of the easternmost peninsula of the mainland island known as Deerness. Later referred to as the Deerness Mermaid, the aquatic humanoid creature was the conjecture of more than several hundred sightings, made by both visitors and locals to the island. Unlike common mermaid tales, however, the Deerness Mermaid was described as being a terrifying creature to look at. Reports claimed that the creature was estimated to be more than seven feet in length from the top of the head to the tail, and had a long black head with a torso that was pale white in colour, similar to that of a body bloated at sea. Its most terrifying features were its elongated arms, with reports claiming to have seen the creature clawing up on rocks or moving in long, dramatic waving motions as if begging people to enter the water alongside the creature. Sightings of the DNS mermaid would continue for the following years, with claims that the creature would return in the summer months and disappear during the winter months. It was due to these repetitive sightings that the popularity of the creature grew with visitors taking trips to the mainland Orkney Island in the hopes of spotting the mermaid for themselves. Although random mermaid sightings around the shores of the Orkney Islands have persisted even up until the modern day, the last known continued sighting of the Deerness mermaid is believed to have been made back in 1893, with the creature fitting the exact description of the Deerness mermaid never reported or seen again thereafter. The Cryptogram of Olivier Lavasseur Olivier Lavasseur, otherwise known as Labouze, was well known for his swift and ruthless capturing of his enemies. 
but his buzzard-like methods of raiding wasn't his only claim to fame. It is said that Lavasseur hid the largest pirate treasures ever known, estimated at over one billion pounds, and perhaps his biggest legacy is the cryptogram he left behind to find it. Born into a wealthy French family in the late 1600s, Lavasseur's life was already set up for success. He was fortunate enough to procure an excellent education before landing as a naval officer. In fact, during the War of Spanish Succession, King Louis XIV granted him a letter of marque. A letter of marque allowed private vessels to attack and capture enemy vessels during wartime. After the war had ended, Levasseur and his ship were ordered to return home. He had other plans, however. He had become much too accustomed to his lifestyle at sea and decided to join up with the Benjamin Hornigold Pirate Company. And after some time with Hornigold and a brief partnership with Black Sam Bellamy, Levasseur wanted to go at it on his own. He spent most of his pirate career along the West African coast. After 1720, he launched primarily from the island of St. Maria, which is located just off Madagascar. Levasseur and his crew, which by this time consisted of over 750 men and three ships, later took place in arguably one of the most famous pirate raids, the capture of Portuguese ship Nossa Senhora de la Cabo, or Our Lady of the Cape. This particular ship was loaded with treasure and gold as it belonged to the Patriarch of the East Indies and the Viceroy of Portugal. The pirates easily took the ship which was anchored for repairs following a storm. Aboard the ship were many bars of gold and silver as well as boxes of golden guineas. There were diamonds and pearls, silks, art and religious items brought from the Sacathoral in Goa. The biggest piece of treasure was the Flaming Cross of Goa. The cross was made of pure gold and adorned with gemstones. It was so heavy that it took three men to move it to Lavasseur's ship. The treasure from this particular raid was so big, the pirates didn't even rob the people aboard, even though they usually would have done so. This particular raid would go on to inspire Robert Louis Stevenson while writing Treasure Island. In 1724, when amnesty was being offered to all pirates who would renounce their lifestyle, Lavasseur refused. The French government demanded their stolen treasure back and he was not willing to hand it over. Instead, he settled in Seychelles and tried to stay hidden. Eventually, he was captured and hanged for piracy in 1730. Now, just where was all of that treasure that Lavasseur had been hoarding? The tale states that as he stood upon the scaffolding, waiting for his sentence to be carried out, he exclaimed, Find my treasure, the one who may understand it before tossing a necklace containing a 17-line cryptogram into the spectators. Two treasure hunters, Reginald Herbert Cruz Wilkins and his son John, have now devoted their lives to decoding the cipher and finding the treasure. Reginald had spent 27 years hunting Levasseur's treasure. Only his death in 1977 stopped his quest. Now John continues his father's hunt. Though some people doubt the validity of the cipher, the British Museum has tested the document and proven it to be parchment from the 18th century. Although the cipher seems like nonsense to some untrained, it is widely known that Lavasseur was well educated. According to John, his father spent years decoding the cryptogram. He believed that the code broke down to a riddle inspired by the twelve labours of Hercules, that is, the twelve tasks Hercules was to perform to return home according to Greek mythology. John now believes Levasseur's treasure is somewhere on the Seychelles island of Mahe. Although, in his own words, John is sure he has found the location, remaining vague as to not draw attention to his site, he has been shut down for digging since 2009. The local government requires a 250,000 rupee fee for him to continue his digging. Will John find Levasseur's bounty? He is determined to do so. He will need to be mindful, however. According to John, his research suggests there may be a final booby trap he will need to outsmart before he gets his hands on all of that treasure. The Mongolian Almas Monster With reports of the Yeti and Sasquatch surfacing from all around the world, 
It is no surprise to cryptozoologists that the Mongolian kingdoms also had their own reference to giant ape-men creatures that would dwell within the distant mountainsides and wilderness uninhabited by human beings. Known as the Almas, these Mongolian hominids were believed to have inhabited the Caucasus and Pamir Mountains across Central Asia as well as the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia, of which the majority of ancient reports were made. The oldest known verifiable record made of the Almas was written by a man known as Hans Schildberger, a prisoner of the Mongol Khan that had been sent to Mongolia and wrote about his observations of the surrounding landscape and people back during the year 1420. In his journal, he wrote the following excerpt surrounding the Almas creatures. On the same mountain, here specifically referring to the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia, there are savages, who are not like other people, and they live there. They are covered all over the body with hair, except the hands and face, and run about like other wild beasts in the mountain, and also eat leaves and grass and anything they can find. The lord of the country sent to a digi a man and a woman from among these savages that had been taken in the mountain. Additional reports detail that the Almas are consistently described as being human-like bipedal creatures, typically between the height of five and six and a half feet tall, a monstrous size compared to people during that time period and so were often depicted as giants. Their bodies have been detailed as being varying tinges of reddish and brownish hair, with ape-like animalistic facial features such as a pronounced and enlarged brow line, a wide flat nose and a weak chin. There have been endless debates, both archaeological and scientific, surrounding the existence of the Almas as a genuine species. Some have argued that the Almas may have been a small population of surviving evolutionary ancestors given that their descriptions made them more humanoid than ape-like in appearance, and that their omnivorous nature and animalistic behaviour pointed towards signs of less evolved intelligence. Others believe that the creature could have been a species entirely different from humanity, and could have been an undiscovered branching of the species in the past caused by the physical separation of humans in the mountains and wilderness. Researchers will generally dismiss the validity of the Almas, however, under the claim that for such creatures to exist in the modern day, it would require a rather large population that could not go unseen and so argue that the species either never existed or is now extinct in the modern day. Despite such sentiments, the Mongolian people today continue to claim to see the Almas when talking of terrifying encounters with the giants in the Altai Mountains. Information on Extraterrestrials Evidence of extraterrestrial life and aliens is not something you might expect to get from any major religious organization, let alone the Vatican. The Vatican has spent hundreds of years looking up to the heavens in prayer, so with the centuries that have passed, have Vatican scientists come across something more and could they be hiding it in the Vatican's secret archives? New evidence may prove that the Vatican not only has evidence of aliens, but might even be hiding these otherworldly beings from the public. The priest who directs the Vatican Observatory, Dr. Jose Funes, said in an interview that the universe is so huge that it would be possible that life could evolve the way we know it on Earth. It might not seem an odd statement, but this was the first time Vatican officials had ever publicly acknowledged the likelihood of alien life. Not only that, but this is a dramatic reversal of Vatican policy that previously stated aliens did not exist. Something significant must have occurred for the Vatican to reverse a 2,000-year-old teaching or else a discovery unearthed or encountered that made releasing this statement urgent and necessary. Previous claims have noted that the Vatican might have empirical evidence of intelligent life beyond our planet. After all, the Vatican has a well-funded but private scientific academy, the Pontificia Academia delle Scienze, or rather the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, well dedicated to astronomy and the heavens above. Further, it was affirmed that in 1998, Skulls with elongated heads and small faces that were not of human origin or any discernible species on this planet were found under the Vatican Library. This claim has been voraciously denied time and time again. Encounters with the U-28 Creature During the early years of World War I, there was a sighting of a strange monster out in the open ocean that would later be referred to as the U-28 Creature. According to the reports surrounding the creature, 
The encounter occurred on the 30th of July back in 1915, when a German U-boat commander known as Commander Freya George G. von Forstner wrote a detailed report following his attack against the British steamer, the Iberian, claiming that after the steamer sank, there appeared to be a large aquatic animal described as being approximately 80 feet in length and similar to that as a large crocodile. The report is quoted as stating the following. At that moment, I had with me in the conning tower six of my officers of the watch, including the chief engineer, the navigator, and the helmsman. Simultaneously, we all drew in one another's attention to this wonder of the seas, which was writhing and struggling among the debris. We were unable to identify the creature, but all of us agreed that it resembled an aquatic crocodile, which was about 60 feet long, with four limbs resembling large webbed feet, a long pointed tail, and a head which also tapered to a point. Unfortunately, we were not able to take a photograph, for the animal sank out of sight after 10 or 15 seconds. Cryptozoologists believe reports of the U-28 monster directly matches the whale-eater cryptid of centuries-old encounters. Over the past eight centuries, consistent sightings of a creature known as the whale-eater have been made all across the world, with notable sightings being made well into the modern day. The creature has been described as being an estimated 43 feet in length, having an elongated head, a short neck, a crocodile-like body, four flippers for locomotion, and a short tail. Since the 13th century, sailors have claimed fantastic stories of massive sea monsters that are known for hunting down and eating whales of all sizes. Cryptozoologists have speculated that the whale eater is a surviving member of the Pliosaurus marine reptile species that was estimated to have gone extinct about 65 million years ago. With its crocodile-like appearance, the whale eater would more than accurately fit the description of the Pliosaur and would explain the large number of sightings made throughout history. Additionally, on the 13th of August 2012, a 65-foot whale was found beached on the sandy coast of St. Austell. Before efforts could be made to assist the whale, the creature suddenly died. When experts analysed the whale, they found that there were deep gashes all across the creature's face that looked eerily like a massive single bite mark, with the teeth-like punctures curving evenly into a U-shape across the whale's entire face. One of the reports was quoted as saying, based on the photographic evidence, a creature with huge, long, crocodile-shaped jaws lined with big, sharp teeth attacked the whale. Beast of Dean It is believed that a strange animal that looked like an oversized wild boar used to live in the forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, England. During the second half of the 17th century and the early years of the 18th century, Local farmers were frightened by the beast that was believed to be large enough to fell hedges and trees. In 1802, local hunters finally managed to kill the creature. Once they inspected the body of the dead beast, they found that it wasn't a boar, nor was it any other species known to locals. Over the next couple of centuries, there were some other reported sightings of the Beast of Dean. Some locals also reported hearing unearthly roars similar to the ones made by the beast killed in 1802. Despite some claims of the sightings, no major incident took place until 1998, when James Nash and Marshall Davis, two locals of the area, encountered the beast. They reported the incident and said that they were walking in the woods when suddenly they felt the presence of an animal. Before they could prepare themselves, they saw a large beastly figure charging towards them in the darkness. James and Marshall started running towards the village of Park End, and the beast chased them till they reached a well-lit road outside the forest. At that moment, the beast made an unearthly roar and disappeared into the woods. This was the last sighting of the Beast of Dean. No one knows much about this mysterious creature. Some people believe that there could be an isolated population of wild boars, with a few of them gaining extraordinary size. However, the account of the beast killed in 1802 does not support this theory. Hawkesbury River Monster Though the Loch Ness Monster and descriptions of its appearance as a long-necked beast of the sea has gained a renowned fame that stretches across the entire globe, it appears that given new myths and sightings of a long-necked monster from the large rivers of Australia, the country appears to have its own variation of the Loch Ness Monster that locals refer to as the Hawkesbury River Monster. 
the Hawkesbury River monster has been spotted by many different Australian residents in large rivers and even smaller tributaries across the country and was later confirmed in a sighting by cryptozoologist Rex Gilroy who believes to have spotted the river monster in full detail. He described the beast to have a similar design in appearance to the ancient plesiosaur of prehistoric times, a creature that was known to have once existed and skeletons of its fossilized remains are on display in museums around the world. Rex Gilroy and many others of the Australian populace that have reported the sightings believe the river monster to be a surviving variation of the plesiosaur from the times of the dinosaurs. An interesting fact they cite as evidence was the findings of vampire squid near the continent closer to several coasts from the beaches near the sightings of the Hawkesbury monster. Archaeologists used to believe that the vampire squid had long since become extinct and was known to be a common source of food for the plesiosaur in ancient times. Knowing proof of the existence of the surviving food source, many cryptozoologists then believe that it isn't much of a stretch to further support the evidence of a plesiosaur in the modern era. Given the reported sightings at certain times of the year, many researchers believe this could be a time of breeding when the monsters travel up the deeper rivers similar to that of other fish species to spawn. After spawning, they could very easily enter back into the ocean and continue their life cycle. Running data off of this estimate puts the potential population of this mysterious beast at approximately 300 to 600 Hawkesbury River monsters, one estimate that must be growing every year as sightings and evidence of the beast continues to grow in a similar fashion. Brodeer of Man Brodeer of Man is best known for his military efforts in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Brodeer was described as tall and strong, with long black hair and clad in a coat of mail which no steel could bite. Between himself and his brother Ospak of Man, the two had over 30 ships to their name and were described as men of such hardihood that nothing can withstand them. While his brother was famed for his wisdom, Brodeer was known for his skills in sorcery. At the time, Brian Boru was a powerful king in Ireland. However, at 88 years old, he was no longer in a physical state to fight. What's more, his many victories against the Vikings in Dalkay, Sukhoi, and Bilach Lekta left his relationship with the other Viking leaders in a perilous position. One of his Viking foes was Sigtrig Silkenbeard, king of Dublin and son of Boru's ex-wife Cormlod. Sigtrig was allowed to remain as king of Dublin as long as he pledged loyalty and paid tribute to Boru. But soon he plotted with Earl Sigurd of Orkney and Brodeer to defeat him. Notably, to Boru's credit, Brodeer's brother Ospak refused to fight against so good a king, so the two brothers found themselves on opposing sides. The Battle of Clontarf took place on Good Friday and was the greatest battle to take place in Ireland. It was said that Brodeer knew he and his army were doomed from the beginning. According to Niall's saga, when sailing for the battle, a loud and unpleasant noise passed over Brodeer and his men, which immediately awoke them. Emerging from their beds, they were horrified to see the noise was accompanied by a shower of boiling blood. The next night, they woke to an assault on their ships led by a ghost army equipped with flying swords, axes and spears. These two nights of horrors resulted in at least one death on every ship. Brodeer asked for guidance on what these events indicated and was told they showed that he and his men would be dragged down to the pains of hell. Just as the premonitions told, Boru's army quickly began pushing back against Brodeer and his Viking allies. In a desperate tactical bid, Brodeer abandoned his army and snuck up behind Boru's brother, Wolf the Quarrelsome. However, Wolf easily overpowered Brodeer and sent him running and hiding in the woods. Knowing that the battle was lost, Brodeer charged at Boru's camp where the king had been advised to await the outcome of the battle. There are many tales of heroic deeds during the Battle of Clontarf, such as Boru's son Murdo, who was said to have killed 50 men with the sword in his right hand and 50 men with the sword in his left. However, Brodeer rushing in and killing the elderly Boru while the king was mid-prayer was not one of them. Almost immediately Brodeer was seized by Boru's stepson Ulfrida, 
who slit his belly and nailed his gut to a tree and forced Brodeer to walk round it until he disemboweled himself. Following the Battle of Clontarf, Sigtrig was the only leader of the rebelling army to survive. While he remained as king of Dublin, the Viking power in Ireland was broken forever. The main focus of all shifted to integrating the Celtic chieftains and the Vikings to live peacefully and harmoniously. Despite his death, it was Borrow who was remembered for his victory and acclaimed as Ireland's national hero. The Valley Hill Lights Valley Hill Lights is located in the picturesque Springfield in Kentucky. Springfield is generally known for its babbling brooks, tall trees and blue skies. However, if one were to travel down Route 55, you would approach the valley which is renowned for something far more substantial than scenic views. In April 1995, eight young girls and their Catholic education teacher had several religious sightings alongside random visions of bursts of colour and showers of golden flakes. One of the students, Mandy Mattingly, described seeing an array of colours around a pulsating sun. The other girls described seeing gold colours appearing on their flesh, which their teacher photographed. When these pictures were developed, the teacher and students were shocked to see angels surrounding the lights and in one image Jesus and the Virgin Mary in a veil. One of the students, Sabrina Ballard, said she could see the name of her deceased cousin, Kate Ballard, on a tombstone in the background of one of the photographs. Amanda Terrell was another of the eight girls and still to this day credits the events of that day for giving her more of a spiritual background and making her feel closer to God. Terrell is not the only one. At its peak of popularity, scores of people travelled to the valley and described how the experience drew them closer to God. Hazel Spaulding is one of these visitors and describes how she knew that the place held special powers from above as the rosary she was holding turned gold and she could suddenly smell roses without there being any rosebush in sight. Angel Wimsat supports her by describing how you know something is going on in the very special valley. Notably, there are individuals who are not convinced of the authenticity of the visions. Dr. Joe Nickel managed to get his hands on the original photographs taken by the teacher of the eight schoolgirls and argues that the most likely explanation for the images of angels were due to a cartridge leak and that the image of Jesus and the Virgin Mary was a result of pareidolia, a psychological phenomenon that causes people to see patterns in a random stimulus. The inscription of Ballard's late cousin's name in the tombstone, Nickel argues, is actually an imprint from the back of the Polaroid photo pack. Despite skeptics like Nickel, many continue to travel to the valley in a bid to glimpse a vision of the Virgin Mary.